Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome. Today we are looking at the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. One of the very key center attributes of the Most High God. There are many things about God. His, uh, his attributes are innumerable. It's just that the measure shows you there's the wisdom of God, the power of God, the love of God, the patience of God, the omnipotence of God, the omniscience of God. And every one of these, they are not like separate, it's still the same one true being. Well, because God is infinite. So anything that He is is also infinite. So we can't talk about the love of God and it's unrelated to the righteousness of God. Neither can we talk about the justice of God and it is unconnected to the wisdom of God. They are kind of interwoven. Yes, from our own human perspective, you might be able to say this relates to the wisdom of God. But in the wisdom of God, you will see the righteousness of God. In the, uh, the benevolence of God, you are going to see the omnipotence of God and power. So today we are looking at the righteousness of God. There's no end, there's no beginning to, there's no end, there's no beginning to any attribute of God because it is infinite. It's just what measure God has shown to us. So at the heart of the being of God is His righteousness. Some of my ask, what is righteousness? We think righteousness is God always doing what is right at the right time with the right means. So God not being an unjust God, let's put it in a simple term, that is God never acting unjustly towards anyone. So at the heart and the center of God's, of God's being is His righteousness. And unrighteous being could not be sovereign. That would be a calamity on the surface of the earth or in the universe. He who must be deity must be righteous in his ways. And we see this fact that that's the reason why when Adam sinned, I mean, death had to come in place. And thank God, thank God that God in his righteousness, because the things we could not pay for, because if anyone sinned, it's death anyway, the soul that sinner shall die. But God in his wisdom now carved a righteous way by which he can save us. It's a mystery in itself. So with God to be righteous and to be God are one and the same thing. So you can't say this is a righteous, this is righteousness, and this is God here, yeah, like separate beings. If it's if this is righteous, that is God. Because none is righteous but him. He said that um, that all our righteousness is that few the rats before him. So God himself is not uh, the standard of righteousness is not distinct from God. Righteousness is not here and God is here. No, no, no. If righteousness is here, that is the true and living God himself. So to, with God, to be righteous and to be God are one and the same. Maybe that's why in the place of intercession, when Abraham was praying, shall not the judge of the or shall not the judge of the earth be righteous? I mean the righteous one, because he was pleading that look, let there be mercy. If we find X number of righteous people in the land, and I mean on and on, it's just to show that God never acts impulsively without a the highest good of the creatures in mind. Even when his wrath is at work, it is also a righteous law. Wrath. We get there once we get it. So God is righteous as well as holy. And this is one, it, it, it's, it, I won't say I have the whole ways of distinguishing between God's righteousness and God's holiness. But for at least from what we know, that it's the very essence and the nature of God. So where has holiness means in the context of the Hebrew language as we learn, means separate, distinct, uncommon, that is in a class by itself, incomparable. So as the Father is the Holy Father, as the Son is the Holy Son, as the Spirit is the Holy Spirit, His city is holy. Then when it comes to righteousness, we are talking about the character and the ways of a person. So there's a difference between what, not that there's a difference, but a distinction between what's the inner attribute of a person, the distinct nature of their inner attribute, being separate in everything that there is. And there's also the character and the ways through which they go about doing what they do. So holiness relates to God's distinct inward nature. We could just use that, that it is what makes God separate from every other being. Holiness is what makes God separate. That's why when the 24 elders and the four living creatures and angels are shining, holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. In, in the, we could say, we could almost re relate it like separate, separate, separate are you. Uncommon, uncommon, uncommon are you, Lord. Dixton, 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 in a class of itself. Now we could say righteousness relates to God's character and ways of doing things. That is, God not going through crooked means to get what he wants to get accomplished. It's almost like it's interrelated, you might want to say, but of course, if those two terminologies were used in the Bible, that means there could be some 
differences between the two not sharp differences per se but of course you understand what i mean holiness relates to god's distinct inward nature his essence of purity now righteousness of course has to do with purity as well but this talks about the outward character and ways of god so holiness we could say maybe more like an intrinsic inward essence of god then righteousness is what we see on the outside when god is at work we can see that this is the righteousness of god that is at work so god being just in all his actions and dealings is his righteousness so like we said righteousness is more of an outward attribute of god that is his ways because um, when god is being just and fair in his dealings in his actions in his judgment we say that is the righteousness of god at work god has never done the least wrong to any creature I repeat, God has never done the least wrong to any creature. And I believe one of the reasons why we could attribute that to is because of the righteousness of God. And it's not because uh, God is conforming to an external standard or an external law or something compelling him from outside. It is who he is. To be righteous and to be God is the same with God. It is who he is. He can't, he, 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 he can't go against his nature. He can't go against himself. He will always do what is right at every time. So as his power is opposed to all material or all natural weakness, so his righteousness is opposed to all injustice. So the power of God knows no weakness. There is no weakness in the power of God because that power doesn't diminish, neither does it increase. It is infinite, it is omnipotent. Then we could say, so is the righteousness of God. It is opposed to everything that is unjust unfair injustice wickedness whatever synonym you want to use and this is why for us it's very important because as believers especially in the place of prayer or in the happenings of situations and circumstances all around us that there is a righteous one who judges all matters and it doesn't mean we don't intercede or pray for his judgment but let's be aware that there is god is not passive neither is he in uh is is he carefree about his creation every matter whether it's invited or not in my own opinion i believe god will judge it righteously even when animals are fighting and one way or the other one is in the right one is in the wrong god will ultimately judge them because it is his creation so as his wisdom cannot turn to foolishness so his righteousness cannot turn to wickedness the wisdom of god can never be can never lose relevance it can never turn to folly it can never turn to foolishness it can never turn to reproach never never it might look like it because it might look like it, but the goal the end of it you find out that this is the wisdom of god at work an example is the crucifixion of christ to the gentiles it looked like foolishness the messiah hanged on the tree what kind of messiah is that he can't even save himself but therein is the wisdom of god in that first corinthians chapter one that the wisdom the foolishness of god is greater than the wisdom of men so god uses the the, the foolish things of this world to confound the wise so his righteousness can never turn to wickedness never we will not find iniquity in God. We will not find ill will in God. We will not find wickedness in God. It is forbidden. It is contrary to everything that is of his nature. And that is why when we are praising and adoring him for who he is, it's a joy because we are blessing his holy name for who he is. So righteousness is God's infinite moral essence. By infinite moral essence, we are talking about the you know, moral attributes, right? The, uh, the, the propensity to always do what is right. To always do what is pure to always do what is uh what is not injurious to another being and that is why we say it is infinite in itself others we have morality as creatures but god's own is infinite it's uh, there's no you can't measure it it is it is beyond any scope of measurement so god is negatively annihilated from all unrighteousness and it's anytime there's unrighteousness anywhere it is god will never in my opinion will never be part of such god will even at the end we still judge everyone that is involved in such unrighteous act and so that's why maybe god was in the book of psalm i mean exalting david don't be envious of the wicked their end is just destruction because it's not even if nobody prays for them to be destroyed there are certain laws or codes or we could say uh, forces that are at work in god's creation that when, when it appears a person is is having is cutting corners or having headway over certain things they are doing that is injurious to god's creation there are forces that still supervise that we, even without intercession and i'm not saying we don't intercede or neither that we should not pray but there are things at work that ensure just like 
gravity. It's a law, whether anybody believes it or not. So God's righteousness, so, uh, in uh, uh, um, Psalm 89, that righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Could you imagine that the foundation of God's throne, where God sits as judge over the heavens and the earth, that it is based on righteousness and justice. Let me go there to Psalm 89. I think the Psalm of Moses, Psalm 89, verse, um, maybe verse 14 there about. Psalm 89, I think it was in the early part of it. Psalm 89, verse 14. Justice and judgment, or righteousness, some translations have it. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. Mercy and truth shall go before his face so righteousness is the unshakable found and you know that the foundation is very critical to any the foundation is what holds a structure if the foundation is faulty the whole structure no matter how beautiful interiors are is a sham is all going to crumble so when god says that righteousness and truth are the foundation that means god is saying that his throne is going to disintegrate I mean, it's a scripture. When you say foundation, it means that if there's a fault there, the whole building will collapse. And that's why it's, we said it's at the heart of the being of God. So God is righteous not because he adheres to external rules, but because whatsoever he does becomes right. So when God says, for example, let's say it's in the evenings in the night, and God says, oh, good afternoon. If you check, it is no longer evening or night. It, the, the whole thing changes to whatever God says because God is the standard of righteousness. So if God should say something like, um, um, uh, congratulations for the new car. It, the person is talking to, my never have seen a car before, doesn't own a car. But the moment he pronounces it, because he's the righteous one, all the forces of elements of creation creates that car for that person. So it is impossible for him to lie. So God is righteous, not because he adheres to external rules, but because whatsoever he does becomes right. He is the standard of righteousness. So once God says, you are healed, regardless of the symptoms or whatever that is in there, Everything because his words are creative. That's how he made the heavens and the earth. That sickness has disappeared. It might not appear on the face of it at the moment, but it could appear. It might not appear because there are instances where the Lord spoke a word, like the fig tree. It wasn't as if the, the, he, he spoke the word, he is cursed. It didn't really appear, but the word has been spoken. And in no distant time, the manifestation came. So God is the standard of righteousness. Because God cannot lie. Anything he says becomes right. Because at the core of his being is truth. There is no falsehood in what in he that is the truth. It is even impossible for him to speak a thing and to be a lie. Because the essence of his being is truth. So whatever he says, whether he means it or not, I'm not saying God does that, whether he means it or not, or becomes truth is, is instantaneously a truth and so that's why i said that you shall know the truth and the truth shall say because the truth is not just a doctrine the truth is a person is a person is the being of god himself so because god cannot lie anything he says becomes right because the core of his being is truth the core of the being of god is truth that's why second Corinthians chapter 13 says for we can do nothing against the truth but for the truth so you can see how righteousness connects to every almost every other attribute of god from the beginning of the bible to the end we see the righteousness of god at work we still get to romans where he said that the righteousness Herein is the righteousness of God displayed, that is in the gospel, whereby the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Great and wonderful are your works, Lord God the Almighty, righteous and true are your ways. Again, connecting righteousness to the ways of God. This is in Revelation chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15, I think verse 8. Oh, uh, Revelation 15, verse. Um, Hallelujah. Oh, Hallelujah, Hosanna. Revelation chapter 15, verse 3. Revelation 15, 3. And they, sing, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, you King, O King of the nations. So we can see that, again, we see that the righteousness of God is connected to the works of God. 
and of course the works of God relates to what the creation works of God even the works from eternity past the creation the providence work which providential work that is God now sustaining his universe having finished his creation work and also the works of God in salvation it is you see we see that trade we see that essence of God's righteousness all true so Revelation 15 3 says great and wonderful are your works Lord God Almighty righteous and truth are your ways so any part that looks to be crooked and dubious, suspicious, it is, it is, it, it is, it, 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 we could almost say that this can't be God at work. If it is God at work and it appears to be, or it appears to be uh, crooked, that means we don't know every detail about what is going on in there. We might be conceiving or perceiving things in our mind, looking at it from a wrong point. If it is God, it is always righteous because the foundation of his throne is righteous there. So it's not like anybody begging God to be righteous. He himself has said that, look, the throne I'm sitting on, the foundation of that throne is righteousness and truth. So God's righteousness is his just and fair ways of doing things. That is God being just and fair. Even when God will promote anybody, God has to be righteous in his promotion. He doesn't just promote arbitrarily. And this is why it is always very key in our understanding of the person of God. So that we are not being lazy, lackadaisical, like and saying that God will transfer the wealth of the wicked because we are his children. And maybe some are lazy. They are not laboring in the world. They are not working in love. They are not working in intimacy with him. And oh, the money will just jump or the wealth will jump. No, God is also righteous in the dispensing of his inheritance to his children. I mean, Revelation, sorry, Galatians chapter 4. It says, and here, as long as he remains a child, doesn't differ from uh, a slave. So we can see that part in there that even in everything God is doing, He's righteous in His way. He doesn't again, so that we don't go to the extreme thing that uh, uh, we are justified by works. That is because of what we do. There is what we do. There is a labor we do. There is a work we do. But the righteousness of God breathes over it. And so there's a place where someone is bringing diligence to what they are doing. But you and I know that it is not the most diligent that are the most successful in life. Because there are other elements, variables at work in life. Life is deep. There are spiritual forces that even a man may be walking like an elephant and what is coming is just like ant. but now God in his righteousness now adds his own grace upon it so that there will be fruitfulness for every labor we're putting out there so the love of God is a righteous love so the love God shows towards us is not an unrighteous love and what do we mean because this love is unmotivated it is a love that is not there's no ulterior motive in the love of God God loved us before we were created even when we were sinners, Romans 5, it said that while we were yet sinners, God commended his love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the love of God is also a righteous love. Also, the sovereignty of God is a righteous sovereignty, meaning that it is, it is going to be terrible for a sovereign being for an unrighteous person to be sovereign. Because sovereignty means that you can do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it however you want to do it with whoever you want to do it and nobody can question you so imagine such a being being unrighteous that means wickedness and anarchy and i mean all kinds of crazy things will pervade the universe so god in his sovereignty is also righteous so even when he does things at what we call the sovereign that is, it is not arbitrary so it's not that god can just wake up he, 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 though, when, when we say God is sovereign, we are saying that God will always act as he wants to act, but never to the detriment of his creation. It will always be for the highest good of his creation. It doesn't mean he won't punish you. There will be no, I mean, act of, uh, of judgment coming in. But it is ultimately towards the good of his, uh, his creation in its entire scope. So also the benevolence of God is a righteous benevolence. Benevolence is that, that kind-heartedness of God. That munificence of God. That, that, that is that liberality of God. The abundance of God. Whereby he loves to give things lavishly. But he doesn't give, he doesn't waste God can assess the capacity of every creature and he gives it to them in abundance to the measure of their capacity. He knew the person that, why did he give, why, why is he not the one that had five talents that was wasteful? Because God knew his capacity. Why did he give one to the one that was uh, passive or uh, uh, the one that um, was, uh, uh, didn't make wise use of it? He knew his capacity and he still, he, he still gave it to him because he knew if he didn't give it to him, that one we accuse him. 
that uh, he would have been faithful. He would have done well. It, God, God was partial. But God gave it to him. He knew fully well that this person will not bring much, but let it be to his own that he will judge himself. So he will know the reason why others were. It's just like the sowing of the seed as well, the parable of the seed. He knew that the rocky ground will not bring fruit, but so that the rocky ground will not accuse him that he was partial towards him. So even for us as children of God, we need to grow in the knowledge of God. The, the, we need to grow because what it does for us now, we now start bringing diligence to what we are doing. Whether it is in our work with God, we know that God is not just arbitrary in his ways. He is righteous in it. So the wrath of God is always a righteous wrath. No wrath of his is unjustified never and one thing you will also notice is that anytime the wrath of god is coming before the wrath of god there's hardly any way among us is among humans whereby because i can speak for human i can't speak for other other beings but there's hardly any way where god will not have sent forth um almost like a plea for repentance a plea that the people should we should should call upon him for mercy and when the mercy and when his cry for him, that's when he sent his prophets and, and when they turn a deaf ear, ultimately you now find the wrath of God now coming in. So it's one thing to do wrong and God will first come and ask you that you even judge yourself. In the case of Cain, what happened? God asked him, where, I mean, where's your brother? Instantly, somebody that's not, somebody because God doesn't depend on people to give him information. He's, 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 he's everywhere. He sees everything that's going on everywhere. And all of a sudden, Cain was still deciding black and white among my brother's keeper and all of God was still giving space for repentance and even before he sinned, God actually told him, sin is knocking at your door yet, after God, I'm not saying we are, we are not guilty of such act because it comes in different packages but I'm trying to say that even when God's word comes, it is never unjustified, he will have given opportunity for repentance opportunity for people to ask for mercy and when they are, not, when they are carefree about it, then he will never be the one to be blamed at it, but else that wickedness might continue to harm other good in his creation, all that he commands is righteous, no command of his is ill willed, that is there is no command of God that is to the detriment of those it is given to and this actually should make us to be excited at every command of god as long as long as you can verify that god this is you you've confirmed it it is to my advantage he stands he, he has nothing to gain from any commandment he gives to god because there's no obedience or that has anything to the essence of god god is perfect perfect means that nothing can be added to make it better so any command he give we, we, all we can be so god give me the grace to be excited at this command because that command is never ill word, whether from scriptures, whether it is uh, him giving us a nudging in our heart. He that, all that he provides is righteous, none of his provision is suspicious. A man could give things or could do acts of charity, but behind it, they probably there's a bit in there. There is like certain things they will require at the end so but god's provisions are never like that he gives rain to the just and to the unjust he knows that even the unjust the the wicked they won't give him glory but yet he allows rain and the sun to shine on them so his provisions are never suspicious and this is why he's such a loving god that's why we cannot help but always to keep thanking and appreciating for all he is for all he does oh what a joy all that he demands is righteous so even when he demands it's not for his benefit the government can demand certain things and rightfully so in the sense not rightfully but they could demand it out of uh, like you know what this will help the government maybe some few people in the government circles or officials and what have you but god will never demand anything that will be to his advantage because there's nothing man can do or creatures can do that will bring an advantage to god always it is always to their good they might not see it and that's why in the place of prayer god opens our soul he demands are not for the for his benefit so when we see this we are not still god is sending us on an assignment it's not that he stands something to gain or benefit it doesn't mean god is not pleased when we obey him but let's not be fooled to think something is added to his essence it's actually for our own good so that he might have the legal ground to reward that's why he places certain demand at certain time and he doesn't just place demand like an outward go and do the no he also works in us to will and to do for his good pleasure what a joy what a great god all that he embarks on is always righteous that is all his endeavors all his works they are always righteous. so his endeavors are pardon the spelling of for the and uh, for our highest good so all the endeavors all his works they are always for the highest good of his creation 
So there is nothing God is embarking on that is not for the good of his creation. There is nothing God has embarked on in the past that is not for our good. Is oxygen not for our good? Are the plants not for our good? And there is nothing we embark on in the future that is not for our good. And that's why he even tells us of things to come so that we can align ourselves. So when we are talking about the righteousness of God, all of a sudden we start looking at God from another perspective that, wow, what a great father to have as a righteous one. That Lord, what a good thing that even in our work, day to day work, world, even where we are working, it might not look like the best of place, but because God can see beyond what we can see, He's preparing us for something greater. We look back and say, God was righteous. God was right in taking me through that path. He didn't look like it in that period. Even when He sends people through the wilderness, it's not because He's punishing them. He's trying to get certain things out of their life so that they will not, so that the wealth in the Canaan land will not be to their detriment or to their fall. All his judgments are also righteous, and the judgments of God are never uh, judgments that he relies on an informant or a thought, uh, a, an eyewitness account. No, 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 because God is omnipresent. So you can see how that omnipresence also connects to righteousness. So he's able to rightly judge every matter because his eyes sees uh, nothing is hidden from me, nothing is invisible to him, nothing can obscure itself or conceal its act from God everything is naked and open before him his mercy does not in any way compromise his righteousness because it will appear that okay when God shows mercy you know he's cooking the books no 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 his mercy is not at variance with his righteousness how do you connect the two, the righteousness of God and the mercy of God. That is what we call the manifold wisdom of God. <laughs> How God we connect two attributes appear to be like uh, that appear appear to be contrary to one another. How can God be just and be merciful? It is called the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is the one that connects the two. And of course, that wisdom of God we could say is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, whereby God now inflicts his wrath, his justice, and his judgment on himself in his son so that he could be merciful so that he could be gracious he could act favorably towards us in christ this is it's called the wisdom of god there's no other definition i know of the righteousness of god is the central theme of the gospel so the central line of the gospel so if the foundation of god is the foundation of the throne of god is righteousness and justice we will now say that the Central theme of the gospel is God's righteousness because herein is the righteousness of God. the gospel is where the righteousness of God is revealed. I have to go to uh, Romans chapter 1. Let's read some scriptures in Romans chapter 1, I think from verse 14 or 15. Romans chapter 1. So, uh, let me start from verse 14. I am the depth of this is Paul, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise, so as much as in me. I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are, in, are also in Rome also, verse 16, Romans 1. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, that is the good news of the person of Christ, because that is the person that connected the punishments or the wrath, the judgment of God, and was able to reconcile us to God so that God could be gracious to us. So I am not ashamed of the good news of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek. Then verse 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So the good news is the of the goodness of salvation is courtesy of God's righteousness because it is in the gospel the righteousness of God is now revealed because the punishment that should have come to man through the fall of Adam God almost this is like uh, what happened God you are supposed to be you could almost say the enemy expecting God to be malicious to be to act in, in his wrath towards man all of a sudden to those that believe is acting in grace in kindness it is because it is the righteousness of God that God will be unrighteous maybe we get in the next time God will be unrighteous not to now save anyone that believe because his wrath has already been poured out on the person of Christ so because Christ has fulfilled all of God's righteousness requirements or righteous requirement God is legally bound to help all that believe God is legally bound this is where confidence comes in the place of prayer that that's where we could say that ah when we are praying we are praying from the consciousness of God's righteousness we are not from our own righteousness but from the fact that 
the what will have disqualified God from hearing us or from helping us was taken away on the cross. So that those conditions, those things that will have inhibited God to act favorably towards us as fallen creatures, now God took care of it on the cross, Isaiah 53, because the wrath was laid upon him. By his stripes we are now healed. So God is now justified to heal us. So that's why we said it will be unjust or unrighteous for God to turn a deaf ear to whoever comes to him on the ground of Christ's finished works. So the whole essence of our salvation, the whole essence of our being, whether it is financial prosperity, spiritual prosperity, marital, relationship, our eternity, our work with God, everything about Christianity, about our faith in this new creation is centered on God's righteousness which is based on the finished works of Christ. So there is no way we will ever, we should never ever think about trying to get anything from God that the basis and the foundation is not the substitutionary work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is because of what he accomplished, that is why God is acting favorably to us. So he's right, he's right and he's righteous in dealing with us graciously as we walk with him. So you can see that righteousness is a very, very, is central to our walking in faith. That's why Romans 1, 16, 17 says again, For wherein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so once we understand this, it now behoves us that as we understand, I don't think anyone will ever understand everything about the righteousness of God, but as we are growing in it, you will now find the propensity to always or also want to always act for the highest good of others. You don't want to do what we arm another person. You don't want to do what will be. It's not because there's an external God is watching, checking his spirit, but there's something in you that you always want to act what is right. And we're not talking about using it to justify yourself before. It becomes your nature as well. What a joy. So God is faithful to us because of his word, or God is faithful to us in his word, and God is righteous to us because of his son's blood. And note that this son's blood, this lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. So what we are taking advantage of today. God's righteousness has existed from eternity. It's as eternal as God. But it is not revealed or made manifest to us until Christ died and we now believe in what he works for us. So we said, although his righteousness existed from eternity, it is not, it is not manifested to us until we believe in Christ. So, true faith in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God now becomes, that's why Romans chapter 5 verse no Romans, sorry. Second uh, Corinthians chapter five, verse twenty-one. That him who knew no sin, for he has made him sin for us. So sin means that what the wrath, the punishment we ought to get from being sinners, God made Christ to be it for us. Who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. So whatever garments of righteousness or what I what, what I call the righteousness that we possess today it is based on the fact that we are in christ and because we are in him, our ways and our work should always be righteous should also be righteous so we can't claim that we have his righteousness and we are walking in unrighteousness it should not be a pattern it should not be that we practice unrighteousness and it doesn't mean that sometimes i mean we won't fall or i mean make here yeah, that that's why we're in a process of sanctification you drop the ball here maybe being unrighteous in your way god corrects you you make amen that test will come again now your passage you go to another level to another class so don't let any devil condemn you for what god is still working in all of us so god offered up his son to die for us so as to have the legal ground to act favorably towards us i may read from romans chapter 8 verse 32 Romans 8 32 the scripture says that he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him also freely give us all things so it's almost like a currency you know a currency is a medium of exchange so because Christ is the currency of God let's use that terminology because God's currency is God himself God and his son that's the medium of exchange so we say that God offered up his son to die for us so as many that now believe in the death of his son that death is for the whole universe sorry for the yeah for the whole mankind let me leave it that way or it's for the universe because god in colossians 1 said he reconciled all things to himself so he now he now has the legal ground to be favorably to deal favorably towards us because what will have hindered him dealing favorably towards us was actually melted on christ on the cross 
what a joy. So he is righteous in himself. He is obligated to none as is his own standard of righteousness. So the standard of righteousness is not something on the outside. It's not something on the external. It's not something compelling God or a law. A, 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 an adjudication or judicial proceedings or a verdict, so to say. No, no, no. He is righteous in himself because he's the holy one, he's the righteous one. He's obligated to none as his own standard. And anything God is, God is the standard for it. The wisdom of God is not the wisdom God is learning through acquisition of knowledge. God himself is his own wisdom. God himself is his own light. God himself is his own righteousness. God himself is his own holiness. God himself is his own power, his own strength. He's not deriving it from anywhere and he's the only being, the sovereignty, in his sovereignty. Everything that he is is based on his own standard. So the Lord is righteous, uh, Psalm 145 verse 17. The Lord is righteous in all he does, merciful in all his acts. And the thing there is like, when the righteousness of God or the justice of God calls for punishment, I'll repeat this again, I said earlier on, and what the people deserve is judgment. God in his mercy will send forth a word. Actually, before they go into their iniquity, if they go into their wayward life, we go into such, if we ever, God, heavens forbid, God will have forewarned because God knows all things. But whether through the preaching, whether through a book, but at that period we might not have probably even taken cognizance that God is trying to say that something is coming and amend your ways. Because what he does with Cain, he told him, say, look, sin is signed as your door knocking. That means God forewarns us as well. Yet, even in our foolishness, when we go on such paths, he will also make a way of escape. I don't want to, you see, fury is not in me. I think it's Isaiah that says so. Fury is not in me. He doesn't want to punish. He now still sends forth word so that there will be repentance. We can ask for mercy. But when people turn down his forewarning, turn down his warning, and not his warning this time, his, uh, his, 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 his invitation for, uh, for repentance. Now, his judgment now, but he's merciful in all his acts because he has to act at some point so that those things doesn't spread or become a cancer to his creation. Psalm 119 verse 1 to say, You have commanded your testimonies in righteousness. This is the King James. But I love the good news. He said, He rules his rules are completely fair and right. So God's rules, God's word, God's laws, God's utterances, God's works, every, God's thoughts, they are all completely fair. That's another word or synonym we could use for righteousness. That is to be fair. He said he hates an unjust weight. He says it's an abomination to him. And far be it that God will partake in anything that is unjust. So, his rules, his way. So, when we understand and we keep growing in this, it's almost like it's, it's an act of love coming from our hearts towards God. We are not even begging creatures or begging man so that we, they, could, they, could, they could facilitate, uh, they could do us a favor. I'm not saying that we are nasty in our relationship. No, we are kind to all. But we are not doing eye service because he that sees in secret, he will reward in the open. So, it's almost like our our number one most important audience is God. That even when nobody is taking notice of certain labor you are doing, certain acts of kindness, God will reward in the open. So what we see in the open is not just arbitrary. It's someone who is, is, is because God is righteous to make sure he rewards every secret labor. I mean, it's very, it's very encouraging to grow in the righteousness of God. I'm growing in this as well. He governs his universe according to his righteous will, statutes, and ordinances. So... The whole universe, the sustenance of the whole earth, of the whole universe by the word of his power is also based on his righteousness. So, nothing is happening arbitrary in the universe. The sun is not shining arbitrary. There is no rain arbitrary. It's just the water that is evaporated to the cloud. The cloud is full. Water for that. It's just God's righteous act, we could say, which is at work. When he judge the uh, uh, during the time of Noah, when the flood came, what happened? He was this righteous. He had won them. He had no but about the wickedness that was in man. The magic was terrible. Well, maybe from the fall of Adam. But this is just to let us know that in anything we are doing, and even when judgment has come, God is also still righteous. When people ask for mercy, even when they have gone their way, they, they didn't heed to his forewarning. After the judgment came, let's say phase one. They were still recalcitrant. 
and but later they now turn to God to say, God, we have erred. God is still righteous in His goodness and His mercy. He still he, he will say that no, no, since you have missed the ball, you have missed it forever. He also still shows mercy. I mean, sometimes he even restores. <laughs> God is beautiful, wonderful. His justice is the distribution and execution of His righteousness. So once we see the justice of God at work, or vet it from His throne room, from His throne, we see that this is God's righteousness. They say, wherein in that Romans chapter one, they say, herein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. And so we can see that even is judgment, they are just distribution. So when we see judgment, we know this is God being a righteous God here. But we can appeal for mercy if it appears it's not favorable to us. We can appeal for mercy on behalf of the land. So we shouldn't just say God's righteousness at work. Because in his righteousness, he will also be merciful. He's also righteously merciful as well. <laughs> if we will but turn to him, he said that if my people who are called my name, we humble themselves. I will heal their land. He simply acts like himself from within, uninfluenced by anything. So it's not somebody compelling him. You must act, you must judge. The essence of his being is right. You don't teach a fish how to swim. A fish naturally just swims as long as it's in that habitation of water. So righteousness is not something God is trying to be. He is righteous. The very essence of his being is righteous. Nobody can compare him because there's no superior to him. So nobody can compare him to act righteous. In the case of, um, of, of Abraham interceding, in the place of intercession, it's what God is the one that brought it to Adam because he needs man to intercede, to intervene for him so that he will not act. So it's not like God doesn't, God is because of Abraham interceding, as when he had got down to five or to ten righteous, God will not have acted. No, it is God that laid it in his heart because God didn't want to punish uh, 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 Sodom, but yet, so, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, but yet because they will not turn back and there was no number of requisite number of righteous one and judgment had to come so god is not defined by the time righteousness rather the time is defined by god it is god that defines that term of righteousness so it is not a time god is conforming himself to be no that time is as god as uh, righteously it, it is it is god that defines that time so when god says anything it is right chicken as they will say in Africa. When God defines anything or does anything, that thing is right. Because the very essence of his being is truth. So he can't do falsehood. He can't do something suspicious. So at the core of his being is his righteousness. At the core of the being of God, at the heart, the center of the being of God in my opinion is God's righteousness. So God is loving because he's righteous. God forgives because he's righteous. God punishes because he's righteous. God restores because he's righteous. And God also, also has now even set ways whereby we could appeal for his mercy in a righteous way. So the word of God, the scriptures were given to us so that our knowledge base of God will increase, so that we will learn how to recalibrate our ways, so that we can act in ways that are in sync with the ways and the righteous path of God. Is totally set apart from all that is alien or alien to his purity. He's totally, he, he hates that, he, said, he hates injustice. He hates unjust means. So he will not partake in such. So that's why I say he's totally set apart. He totally, he doesn't like light and darkness does not mingle together because, because unjust means is, I mean, it's, it's wickedness. It is, it is, it's, oh, I call it slow, quick death to, his, to, the, to the one that has been the, the victim of such act. And God hates such things. So it's utterly consecrated to his own impeccable standard. And that standard is so high. <laughs> we can only go from one level to another in our walk with God. So this is why we call him Holy Father, Righteous One. Be merciful to us. Guide us in the righteous path to come across. I think in Psalm 23, there was a part where the scripture mentioned, it leads me in the path of righteousness. So part of the part of the leadings of God are in the leading in the path of the righteous. Say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the, in the path of righteousness. 
for his name's sake because the foundation of his throne must not be shaken god wants us to know him he always acts justly he has never wronged any creature let me read ahead in psalm 23 verse 4 yea though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, and thou rod and thou staff, they comfort me. The valley of shadow of death could also mean death could be something whereby we deny ourselves. You know, say the Lord said that take up your cross and follow me. Like also Second Corinthians chapter four, I believe, verse ten, where Paul talked about that 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 if life is coming from what death is working or life is coming to them. When somebody, for example, does arm against you or cheats you in a transaction and you let go you forgive that is like a shadow of death so you are denying your right not foolishly but for the fact that you are also beneficiaries of the forgiveness from god or the grace from god so verse 5 that prepared the table before me in the presence of mine that not my head with all my cup runs over surely goodness and message shall follow me all the days of my life and i will dwell in the house of the lord forever so his judgment is the pronouncement of his righteousness so the judgment of god the proclamation of god the word of god the doings of god the salvation of god the wisdom of god whatever god is doing we can always say that the pronouncement of his righteousness so in the gospel we see the righteousness of god at work even in the crucifixion of the lord jesus christ it was the righteousness of god in the resurrection because he will not suffer and holy one to uh, his body to suffer uh, a corruption he must raise him in his righteousness because he was unjustly crucified what a joy he's ethically straight he is never crooked his word is yea and amen his word is yea and amen that is he's faithful to his words and that's why our whole trust that's why we can trust him we can't trust an unrighteous being it's because we don't know that look it could change like a chameleon and god is not such because himself is his own standard and again the foundation of his throne is righteous so because god's righteousness is revealed in the gospel the gospel is the power of god unto salvation we read it again i can as well read it again romans chapter 1 verse 15 and 16. i'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of god unto salvation for therein is the righteousness of god revealed for i am not ashamed of the gospel of christ for it is the power of god unto salvation to everyone that believes to the jew and also to the greek for where therein the righteousness of god is revealed from faith to faith so god's righteousness is revealed in the gospel and the gospel is the power of god unto salvation because we are believing upon the work god has done in christ for us so his righteousness is imputed to everyone that believes everyone that believes god imputes righteousness over them and that's what we enjoy if you go to romans chapter 4 you see must say blessed is that one in whom you will impute no uh, verse romans 4 verse 6 even as david also described the blessedness of the man unto whom god imputes righteousness without works and he now said again in uh, verse 5 but to him that walketh uh, uh, not but believeth but to him that walks not but believes on him that justified the ungodly the faith is counted for righteousness because he is believing upon the finished work of the lord jesus christ and his act of believing is also a work so it's not like god is saying that nobody or else the sinners or the repentance will not will have been partakers of that right but because they have not put their faith in christ which is a which is a testimony that you are accepting you are appropriating what christ has done so god's righteousness is the very heart of his moral being the very center we could say of the moral being of god is the righteousness of god that god will be right in acting god is righteous when he heals yes for anyone that called upon him god is righteous when he provides god is righteous when he answers prayers so it's not like um uh, that is something that is doing out of emotional state no 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 it's being right because we have come to him on the basis of what christ has done so his righteousness forbids him acting unjustly towards any creature so the righteousness of god forbids that god will do arm to any of his creatures he's not on their level he's not on our level so what will he gain from seeing uh from act and he has the power i mean the power the omnipotence is there but because god is not just powerful but god is also the all wise one so his wisdom will not allow him to misuse his power 
And so the reconciliation for the power and the wisdom of God is now when we now say the righteousness of God. So God will rightly use his power so that all may see his wisdom at work. That's why God, will, so a, a, a king or a person with so much power without wisdom will misuse, it will be abused. It will be to the detriment of God's creation. So all his activities is creating, is judging, is providence, is saving of sinners, is righteous. Every activity of God, everything about that book of the Holy Word, the Bible, the Word of God, everything upon it, I could dare say that it is centered on the righteousness of God that God being right in his dealings. That is when God says that, look, this person is healed, whoever believes will be saved. God cannot change his mind tomorrow. If anybody believes, God is bound to save them. If anybody meets the standard or what he has set, meets his commandment, God is legally bound. And usually, so let's not take, try to take credit that, okay, I've done this, I'm holding God to his word and blah, blah. And I, I'm not saying that whatever is wrong, but the attitude to which we come is very, is very sensitive. Because even when we are doing what he commands, it's always good to go back to say, thank you, you, you gave us the grace. You worked in us to will and to do. We can of our own self do nothing. So we are even ascribing back to him that even our ability to obey you is because you worked it in us. Ah, it's a privilege. So that God can work more. Or else if you claim that it's because of your strength, you're able to do this thing, you find that another commandment will come and you now go and sort, you know, you'll be looking for where to go. So righteousness is God doing the right thing at the right time with the right means, not with crooked means. So today we've been able to look briefly at the righteousness of God is a deep topic, but it's always good because it helps us in our meditating on God in our praying to God because we are believing in Him and so if we are believing in Him that means our knowledge base of Him has to be on the increase that's why a lot of the prayers in the New Testament were centered towards increase in the knowledge of God Colossians 1 we see there Ephesians 1 that give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him also Second Peter again grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God uh, through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ John 17 that they might that, that, they, uh, that this is eternal life that they might know you so as the righteousness of God we said the righteousness of God is God being just in all his way God being fair in his dealings with his creature God never doing anything with ill motive or with a with an or with a, with an ulterior motive God is righteous in the past God is righteous in the present God will be righteous for eternity what a grace what a joy that we have such a righteous one as our father and our love his mercy is righteous his love is with righteousness his wisdom is with righteousness his power is with right his judgment that with righteousness what a joy to the greatness of our righteous and our holy father hallelujah to god the father hallelujah to god the son hallelujah to god the holy spirit praise the lord hallelujah